All right, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 to verse 20. So it says, quench not the spirit. Let's don't pull the spirit out. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. All right, so this evening there's a part about uh, being led by the Spirit of God and hearing the voice of God uh, that we didn't get to, and I just feel maybe it's right to teach on that. And it has to do with the gift of prophecy, how God uh, uses men to speak to you concerning his will. And it tells us there in First uh, Thessalonians we saw, he says there that we should not quench the spirit. And how do we do that? By despising prophecy. In other words, if you despise prophecy and you don't allow, all right, room for prophetic utterances, then you are quenching the spirit, for that's how the spirit principally manifests himself. Uh, the Bible tells us in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, it says, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And then the next thing it says, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So if you despise prophesying, then you are quenching the spirit, for he pours out of his spirit upon all flesh, and sons and daughters will prophesy. But then it says in that, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. That's in verse 21. That we shouldn't despise it, but we should prove it and make sure that we hold fast to that which is good. Then I believe in Ephesians, it says, Grieve not the spirit through whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now here it says, quench not the spirit, all right? And then in Ephesians there it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now to quench a person means a person does not allow the person to speak. To grieve a person there means that you, the person, you, well, I mean, it won't be the appropriate word, but you also understand it, means you have offended that person, the person is grieved, you have hurt the feelings of that person there, uh, and so there might, there will be a withdrawal of that particular person. And how do we hurt the, um, grieve the spirit of God? It tells us, let no corrupt communication. Proceed out of your mouth. So words we speak affect the spirit of God inside us. Oh, I leave it. Let's still read it. Proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. So use of edifying. So when you speak words that don't edify people, that you hurt and harm people with your words, you are grieving the Holy Spirit. It says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Then the next verse, it says... Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And verse 31, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And it says you are sealed unto the day of redemption. In other words, if you grieve him, it will affect, all right, the demonstration there of the redemptive work of God, of Christ, within your life as a person. So, you want to look in the New Testament here, and it's a proper Bible study this evening, all right? A look at guidance through the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. First thing I want to establish, just follow this here, about, all right, prophecy. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22 to verse 25, it says, when a person is prophesying in a church, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, but prophesying 
serveth not for them that believe not, but to them that believe. Then he goes on in verse 23. If therefore the whole church has come together into one place, and all speak in tongues, and there come those that are unlearned, or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? All right? But if all prophesy, so every born-again Christian can prophesy. Are you following what I'm saying? It's not just the reserve of the, now that's called the gift of prophecy when it's in operation. There is the office of the prophet. There is the gift of prophecy. All right, I'm speaking about the gift of prophecy that can come on the believer. For the Bible says that the manifestations of the spirit are given to all, all right, to profit with all. So the spirit of God manifests himself and can. So it says, if all prophesy, but I want to see the point of prophecy. If all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one that is unlearned, he is convinced of all, is judged of all. Now, why is this so? And thus the secrets of his heart are made manifest, and so falling down, he will worship God and report that God is in you. In other words, when you are prophesying, you are speaking to things that are already inside the hearts of people. Do you get what I'm saying here? You are not saying something to them that they have no knowledge about. You are not coming in the gift of prophecy to go and minister and say, look, I'm telling you that next year this is going to happen to your family. That's not the gift of prophecy when it's on the believer. He it says the secrets of that person's heart. In other words, what that person has been thinking, what that person, all right, uh, may have been um, going through privately uh, some uh, or a conversation inside their heart that is secrets inside their heart that they have not disclosed to any person, but it's right there embedded in their heart. You speak directly to those things, and they say of a truth, God is to you because no man could have told you this. So let us understand that the gift of prophecy in operation is not to go and start telling people something about their future, all right, and then they start following you into what they don't know anything about. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to build this up so people understand what for prophecy is so that people don't confuse you, but at the same time, you don't despise it. All right? So, someone comes in there and there's a gift of prophecy. Now, a gift of prophecy doesn't necessarily mean, please hear this, that you come to the front of the congregation and you say, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Uh, your daughter hear it. Yeah, you see, it doesn't necessarily mean that. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying here? <laughs> I can be preaching now and a gift of prophecy can come on me and I can give an example of something that happened and I create it and it's the exact thing that is going on in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying here? It means that the message gets into your consciousness, reveals things that are going on privately inside your life you've discussed with no one. You will know that clearly. It reveals it. It gives you, all right, it comforts, it edifies. That's what it says there. And the person understands that God is in operation right inside this place because there is an unveiling there of the very things, all right, that... So a person can have a cell group meeting and a person just went through something, all right, in their private space or at work. And they came for the meeting and the person said, oh, they want to share on this scripture. And they open up that particular scripture and he speaks directly to that particular thing. And the whole conversation, that's the gift of prophecy that is in operation. But I, what I want us to understand is that it confirms a conversation that is already going on inside your heart. So a prophecy at the base level is an utterance in a known tongue that reveals the mind of God for a situation that is already that is going on in the life of that particular person. So it reveals to that person what God is thinking about that particular issue so it registers in the heart of that person. And it is deployed by God to help the person 
in decision making where the person now has information that they didn't gather from their five physical senses but came as the mind of God touched upon that situation and so they know exactly what they are supposed to do. All right? So, the first example is, now, there is prophecy that you, you don't know what's happening. Now, we'll get to that. Maybe I'll talk down Sunday where you don't know. Where it's a prophecy that just came forth that said there's going to be famine in, in that. Nobody knows that. Or a prophetic utterance that comes forth like Noah and says there's a flood coming. All right? That, we'll get to that level. We are starting from the first level. That's a basic prophetic utterance, all right, that can, that, that if people come together, those meetings was talking about that every person prophesies is a believer's meeting. People are there in worship there. And, and the Spirit of God comes upon them, and that spirit of prophecy begins to manifest itself. Now, Acts chapter 9, verse 6. I want to show you here that God can be having a conversation with you and tell you that go to that person's house over there and he will tell you the things I want you to do. And you will say, why don't you tell me yourself? Are you following me? Now, God does it that way so that your brain will be on the ground. Or else, you will begin to walk in pride. That everything, the Lord spoke to me directly. Are you following what I'm saying here? And you'll be floating in the air. The Lord spoke to me directly. So I just want to show you this. Acts chapter 9 verse 6 here. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, now this is Paul when he got saved. He was known as Saul. What will thou have me do? See, he saw the Lord. Abi? In an open vision. Abi? The Lord spoke to him. All right, let's go to verse 5. Because verse 5. Go up. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, he didn't say this, I'm not an angel now. I am who? Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And the, what he's talking about was a sharp ob object that they used to use, all right, to gain God's um, 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 sheep there when, when the shepherd is taking them so that they stay in line. So he's saying it's, a, it's like almost like pointed. It's a hard thing you are kicking against. All right, that. So he says it's a hard thing to kick. And then the next verse, it goes on. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me do? So this is talking to the Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city. It shall be what told thee what thou must do. The Lord said, Go into this city. I am not telling you directly. So I'm sending somebody to tell you what you must do. Now, you may not have had that kind of encounter, but that's the arrangement of God for you as a person, which means I will send somebody to your life who will tell you what you are supposed to do in that particular situation. And if you are not open to that kind of thing and you think that, it's just me, God knows me, Pastor, and just talks to me. I know how God talks to me. You will stone those he sends to you. Are you following what I'm saying? That's why if you isolate yourself from people, you will eventually isolate yourself from God. Now, let's look at what happened here. Go on. Just go on. And the man joined with him and stood speechless, hearing a voice from him, but seeing no man. Verse 8, and Saul arose from the earth when his eyes were opened. He saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Verse 9, and he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. Please hear this story well. It's a Bible story. I'm going to show you something much later, all right, in the scripture that will really help you. Yeah, I need to make you know that um, this life, eh, even inside Christianity, eh, you have to shine your eye very well. All right, you will see what they call apostolic politics. So please listen very because some of people think I, I don't like in the church. I don't listen. You say among apostles, there was politics. Now look at here. And there was a certain disciple Damascus named Ananias, and to him 
said the Lord in a vision. And then that. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and cry of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Now, you will see that while he was praying, things happened. All right? He prayeth. Next verse. It says, And I had seen in a vision a man named who? Ananias. So God already told Paul the name of the person that was coming. Are you following what I'm saying here? This is the second level now. There are some things God can't let somebody tell you without him telling you who is coming to tell you. So even though the person is coming, they are confirming something. I'm trying to tell you that God doesn't put you in the dark. All right? Now, look at what it says here. But he does, he, he, there are some things he will not say to you because that's his arrangement. All right? That's why the Bible says that how can they say they believe without hearing? How can they hear except there's a preacher? All right? And how can the person preach except they be sent? So consciously you have to believe for people to be sent. All right? But quickly, let's go on here. So he says, and he had seen in a vision a man and an ass coming, putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Verse 13. All right? And Ananias answered and said, Lord, now, now, please understand this, and you may use this in future. You can't walk up to somebody and say, God told you to put your hand upon me for you to do so, and so if God hasn't told the person to put their hand on you. Do you get what I'm saying here? Now, now, let me say this here. It is possible that God told the person, the person didn't hear. Do you get what I'm saying? It's possible God didn't tell you, you are just saying it. But it's possible the person didn't hear. But you cannot insist that because I alone heard and you didn't hear, you must do what I heard. Are, are you trying? Do you understand what I'm saying here? You can't come even if Jesus appears to you and says, my child, my child. Listen, you'll see this. He has to tell the other person. All right? He has to tell the other person. All right? And, 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 um, well, let's go on. And you may, I mean, that's why people even in marriage, when they say God spoke to me and told me, God has to tell the other person. Okay? Okay. That telling may not even be they hear the voice, but the telling means they like you. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying here? Because for you to go and miss up and say, this is me, God gave me your name, he told me this, he told me that, you must, you must, so the person looks, eh, okay, so what am I to do? You wear a wedding dress, or wear a suit, follow me, let's go and get, that's exactly what you're saying. All right, please, let's go here, quickly, it's still time. All right. And as I said, I've, so, and I had a problem with that. He said, I've heard about this man. How much evil he has done to the saint at Jerusalem. Please, I just want you to understand how much how deep things you have heard in the past can affect what God is leading you to do. I mean, I know somebody who used to come to this church. She, she fell in love with somebody. She was taller than him. All right, all right, considerably. Now, when she took him home, the father said, you cannot marry him. Why? Because I had a neighbor who was the height of this guy. And was a very wicked man. Now, he therefore juxtaposed what his neighbor did on this, this lady. I said, he's a short, you can't marry him. Now, but you may be laughing, but those kind of things could be triggers in you in your own decision making. And you will see how much it affected Paul in his decision making. I'll show you. All right, so let's quickly go here. So he says this. How much evil... And here, he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. Now, Jesus is talking to you, and yet you are telling Jesus this. All right, let's, let's go on here. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. So you should understand also that if you have reluctance to do some things God says, you are not, you get what I'm saying? Uh, hey, it's not like uh, you are sinful. Do you get what I'm saying? Uh, all right. So look at next. 
but I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17. And as went his way and entered into the house, putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me, that thou mightst receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as to have been scaled to receive his sight, arose and was baptized. Verse 19. It tells us, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then was Saul and certain disciples which were at Damascus. All right? Then we go to chapter 10, verse 2. And let's read under that account here. All right? This was Cornelius. He was a devout man. He feared God. He gave much alms and prayed always to God. Verse 3. And the Bible saw, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour, an angel of the Lord coming, saying to him, Cornelius. And next verse, it says, And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Thy prayers and thy arms have come in memorial before God. Verse 5, And now send to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon Etana, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee. Why didn't he say it? He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Okay? Verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of the household servants and devout soldier, all right, and them that waited on him continually. And then when they had declared all the things that said unto him, he sent them to Joppa. Verse 9. And on the morrow they went on a journey and drew near the city, and Peter went up to the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and would have eaten, but when he was made ready, he fell into a trance, and in that trance, he saw the heavens open. We know the story about the verse, about, and God started trying to get him because of his past, that we can't go to the Gentiles. We can't go to, he was struggling with that. Let's go to verse 15, because of time. All right? Okay, let's go to verse 13. Sorry, I might skip something. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten. So he too was telling the Lord. Can you see how your background affects you? I, I, I want you to understand your background, how it affects you in decision making. Okay. All right. Not so, Lord. You are telling the Lord, Not so. <laughs> I, have never, <laughs> I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice spoke unto him again the second time. What God has cleansed, do not call common. Verse 16. And this was done thrice. And the vessel was received up again to heaven. Verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. You know, after three times he was still saying, am I sure? Behold, the men which were sent from Corinthians had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Now, look at verse 18. And called and asked whether Simon, which was son in Peter, lodged there. Verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. I arise therefore, get thou, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have what? Sent them. So you see, by the time they came to Peter, God also had spoken to Peter. Do you get what I'm saying? All right. So, even when the prophet was sent to the widow, he said, for I have done what? Commanded her. Okay? So, God uh, using uh, the prophetic, so you have that, which God, we are seeing here, is a confirmation of something that is already inside your heart. All right? But God uses a person there to speak prophetically to you, to give you direction Concerning that thing is not anything outside of, of this world, out of your own experience. It's in the context of communication that God already is having with you, and then He further explains it. So, if a person, let's say, comes to church and is, has been thinking about something or by scripture or making a decision, and the word of God is shared and it gets into that, and the person gets a clear explanation. That is prophetic, and God uses that to speak to us from time to time, all right, so that we understand the balance of this. Now, the second one I want to look at is God using the prophetic 
to correct you on something that he has already revealed to you that you are going out of the way. So God may have told you certain things, but, you know, you have dropped those things. You've forgotten about them. You are deviating from that. Just like how we use the us to rebuke the madness of the prophet. When already God had spoken to Balaam about it, but Balaam got drawn by everything that was going on the outside, decided, and then God uses the prophetic there, all right, to speak to that person. In the case where God wants to speak to you. Now, hear this and please get this. Where God is speaking prophetically to you that you have never heard what he's saying before. He will confirm it with two or three witnesses. In other words, if somebody comes to meet you and says that, you are supposed to, all right, move to Abuja, let's just say that, and it's under his spirit of prophecy and says, Thus here the Lord. Maybe you're in a meeting, the presence of God was strong and presence come, Thus here the Lord. You are supposed to move to this particular place. And you had no knowledge about all that stuff before. Are you following me? I'll show you the law of scripture is that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be what? Confirmed. Therefore, you tell God, don't act on what they've said. Oh, go and meet God and tell God, God, if this thing be true, confirm this particular thing by somebody else. And it can be four weeks after you went somewhere and somebody just comes in and says, you know, I believe inside my heart you should go and, and that's confirmation. That person cannot have been in that meeting. That person is not in the circle of that person. Do you hear what I'm saying here? This is an independent confirmation of a voice there that you know that God. And if you push for that because it's God, and say, God, you said the mouth of two. I need three because this decision is quite dangerous. I need a third one. God will give you a third word confirmation of it. Do you understand what I'm saying here? All right? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. I also want to give the example. Then I will show you in the life of Paul here. And I think I will. Ah, I must get to this politics. So, yeah. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be what? Established. Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. It says, But if he will not hear thee, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be what? Established. Now, I want to show you in the life of Paul when people, all right, who operated in the prophetic spoke to Paul about giving him direction. And I'll read Acts chapter 21 and 22, and I think we'll be through with that. Look at Acts chapter 21 here, the Living Bible Translation, please. All right, so it's very simple for people to understand. Living Bible. Now, after parting from the Ephesian elders, we sailed straight to Kors, and the next day we reached Rhodes and we went to Patora. And then we boarded a ship sailing from the Syrian province of, all right, Phoenicia there. And then we sighted an island of Cyprus and passed on there and left and went to the harbor of Tyre and Syria and where the ship unloaded. All right, now this territory now is. It's all non-Christian. All right. We went ashore and found local believers. This what they, so they got into a place and found a group of believers. They were just having a fellowship. They are local believers. All right? And stayed with them a week. These disciples warned Paul, the Holy Spirit prophesying through them not to go to Jerusalem. So Paul was heading to Jerusalem, and he was there with local and... And, and they came and they warned Paul. They said, look, by the spirit of prophecy, we are warning you, do not go to this Jerusalem you want to go to. All right? But Paul was a very stubborn man. And you could see it from his background. Very determined guy. Someone that was killing, killing apostles. Now, that's why I want to show you that your background can kick in. Are you following what I'm saying here? Your background can do what? Kick in in decision making. Even somebody as high as Paul in that apostolic office, you'll see how he kicked in. Now, look at what happened next. And at the end of the week, now, see how the people res respond to the prophecy. Watch, oh, 
At the end of the week, when we returned to the ship, the entire congregation, including wife, children, walked down the beach. So they were walking down the beach. This, wait, this is how they responded to the prophecy. Everybody walked down the beach. With their, put it down, wives and children. They prayed and bid them farewell. And all of us said, we are going. Huh? Are you following me? Okay. Next verse. Then we were bored and returned home. Next verse. The next stop after leaving Tyre was, all right, Tolimas, where we greeted, where we greeted the believers, but stayed only one day. Now look at what happened. Then we went to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the first of the seven deacons. You remember the deacons? Uh -huh. You remember? Uh -huh. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of what? Prophecy. Now look at what they did. During our stay of several days, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea and visited us. He took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, The Holy Ghost declares, So shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jews in Jerusalem and turned over to the what? Romans. Now, look at the reaction now. Hearing this, all of us, the local believers and his traveling companions, begged Paul. They didn't beg him before. It was when the second one came that the confirmation came. Do you get what I'm saying there? In the mouth of two or three windows, let there be every day. Once they, they followed him on the beach. They were doing beach work after the prophecy. They didn't take it seriously. I beg, leave the guy. When the second person came, they said, oh boy, we are begging you. Don't let us go anywhere again. Let's, are you following what I'm saying here? Because if two strange people fall apart, prophesy the same thing. Oh boy, you should know that there is what? There's a problem coming. And this one came from Judah, so he wasn't even in the circle, so they knew. Now look at what he says here. Beg not to go, but Paul, very stubborn man. But he said, why is all this with him? You are breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be jailed at Jerusalem, but also to die for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Next verse. When it was clear that he won't be what? Dissuaded. We gave up and said, let the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> now you see what will happen. Next verse. So shortly afterwards, we packed our things. You should know that every other person on that trip. <laughs> you see, oh, Paul, you're your own. I hope you know those guys are at liberty to take off if there's any problem. And I'm telling you, they packed to take off. You know when you're packing that? Where? When trouble starts, we know where we'll go. Now, right? Now, look at it. So, show where we packed and left for Jerusalem. Some disciples of Sarah accompanied us, and on our arrival, we were guests at the home of all right, Nassim originally from Cyprus, one of the early believers. And all the believers at Jerusalem welcomed us, what? Cordially. Please follow this. Mm -hmm. Verse 18. The second day, Paul took with us with him to meet James and the elders of the Jerusalem church. There is history here. After greetings were exchanged, Paul recounted the many things God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his work. They praised God, but then said, you know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed, and they are all very insistent that Jewish believers must continue to follow the Jewish traditions and customs. <laughs> this is what Paul was preaching against, though. You know. I hope you know. Yeah. Where did God send Paul to? Gentiles. Where was Paul going? <laughs> Where did God send Peter to? When Paul went to rebuke Peter, where did he go to? Gentiles. When you miss the calling, your weakness, are you following what I'm saying? Start showing. This is someone that was rebuking Peter. This is what, come and see what he did though. Now, remember is the elders 
Let me tell you, I'm just trying to tell you, if you disobey God, even apostle and elder that advised you will take off. Just watch what will happen. Now. They will run away. That's why your loyalty should be to who? To God, though. Or else, if you're on your own, you'll be looking around. All right. Our Jewish Christians here at Jerusalem have told us uh, how you are against the laws of Moses, against the Jewish custom, and that you forbid circumcision of their children. Now, what can be done? <laughs> what can be done? What do you want to do about this? All right? For they will certainly hear that you have come. We suggest this. We have four men here who are preparing to shave their heads and take some vows. Go with them to the temple and have your head. This is, this is, can you see when they're advising you against, do you understand what I'm saying here? You're inside the office, they're advising, no, God has told you, no. You know how Lucifer came to me, you can eat it. That your nakedness gets revealed. The person that pushed you to go and do it disappears. Are you following what I'm saying here? And they knew the trigger that was in Paul. They knew that even though Paul was sent to the Gentiles, he had a deep love for the Jews. You remember he said, I can be a cause for the sake of my brother. You know that. It is that thing that Satan was pulling on. I'm saying when the chips are down, Satan will go to your childhood triggers. For you to disobey God. And he will make up, he will, he will, he, listen, look at what happened here. Let's go here. Go with them to the temple and have your head shaved and pay for theirs also to be shaved. All right? Then everyone will know that you approve of this custom for the Hebrew Christians and that you yourself obey Jewish laws and are in line with our thinking in these matters. As for the Gentile Christians, we aren't asking them to follow these Jewish customs at all, except for the ones we wrote to them about. Not to eat food offered to adults and uh, uh, meat and strange animals and to commit fornication. Verse 26. So Paul agreed to their request and the next day went with the men to the temple for the ceremony. Thus publicizing his vow to offer his sacrifice seven days later with the others. The seven days were almost ended when some Jews from Turkey saw him in the temple, roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, men of Israel, help, help. This is the man who preaches against our people and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He even talks against the temple and defiles it by bringing Gentiles in. For down in the city earlier that day, they had seen him with Trophimus, a Gentile from uh, right, Ephesus in Turkey, and assumed that Paul had taken him to the temple. This was fake news now. The whole population of the city, you also see dragging him, electrified by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was dragged. Can you see them? You see how they do? <laughs> Out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. And they were killing him. Where was James and the elders? Disappeared. All the people that were advising him, they've gone. Even the people that traveled with him. Everybody has gone. I'm trying to tell you, if you disobey God, you're your own. All the supporters club that is telling you, do it, do it, oh, do it, do it. Everybody will be gone. Look, they were killing him. Word reached the commander of the Roman garrison that all Israel was in uproar. He quickly ordered his soldiers and officers and they ran down to the crowd. When the mob saw the troops coming, they quit beating Paul. The commander arrested him, ordered him bound with double chains. Then he asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted, can you imagine? The people that were beaten didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Listen, ah, mob shot. Some shouted one thing and some another. So that is what he did. That's what he did. And when they couldn't find out anything in all the opera and confusion, 
He ordered Paul to be taken to the armory. They reached the stairs. The mob grew so violent that the soldiers lifted Paul to their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd surged behind, saying, away with him, away with him. And Paul was about to be taken inside. He said, Commander, may I have a word with you? Do you know Greek? The commander asked, surprised. Aren't you that Egyptian? Can you imagine what they thought of? After all what they were saying, who led a rebellion a few years ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins with him into the desert? No, Paul replied. <laughs> From all what they said, I am a Jew. From Tarsus, Cilicia, right, which is no small town, I request permission to talk to these people. The commander agreed, so Paul stood on the stairs. Disobedience is what? Disobedience. You will soon see. No matter your utterance, no matter your eloquence, he thought, when I talk, just give me time. This anointing, when it comes out, when I talk, when I talk, you will hear. You will find out in the speech, he even confessed his direct disobedience to God. Look at what he said here. The commander agreed. So Paul stood on the stairs and mentioned to the people to be quiet. Soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd. And he addressed them in Hebrew as follows. You know, once the silence comes, you think God is with you. You get what I'm saying here? Brothers and fathers, listen to me as I offer my defense. Next verse. When they had heard him speaking Hebrew, the silence was even what? Greater. So you'll have felt you've got these guys. You know, everybody's not silent. All right? Now, hear what he was saying. I am a Jew, he said, born in Tarsus, a city of Syria, but educated here in Jerusalem under Gamal, at whose feet I learned to follow our Jewish laws and customs very carefully. I became very anxious to honor God in everything I did, just as you have. All right? And I persecuted Christians, hounding them to death, binding and delivering both men and women to prison. The high priest or any member of the council can testify to this so. For I asked them for letters to Jewish leaders in Damascus with instructions to let me bring any Christian I found in Jerusalem to, in chains to be punished. As I was on the road nearing Damascus, suddenly about noon, a very bright light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who is speaking to me, I asked, and he replied, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. The men with me saw the light, but they didn't understand what was said. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up, go into Damascus. There you'll be told what awaits you in the years ahead. I was blinded by the intense light and had to be led to Damascus by my companions. There a man named Ananias, as godly a man as you could find for obeying the law, and well thought of by all the Jews of Damascus. Came to me and standing beside said, Brother Paul, receive your sight. And that very hour I could see him. Then he told me, the God of our fathers, listen to what he said, has chosen you to know his will and to see the Messiah and hear him speak. You are to take his message everywhere, telling what you have seen and heard. Listen to this. And now, why delay Go and be baptized, cleansed from your sins, calling the name of the Lord. One day after my return to Jerusalem, while I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw a vision of God saying to me, Hurry, leave where? Jerusalem. For the people here won't believe you. That's where he went. When you give them my message, God told you, you are there telling them that message. <laughs> Hear what will happen. I'm just trying for you to understand. Listen, this disobedience thing, you know. Listen, look at next verse. But the Lord argued, certainly I know that I am in prison and beat those in every synagogue who believed on you. All right? And when your witness, Stephen, was killed, I was standing there agreeing, keeping the coats they laid aside as they stoned him. But God said to me, what did he say? Leave Jerusalem, for I will send you to where? Far away to the Gentiles. The crowd listened until Paul came to that word. Then with one voice they shouted, away! <laughs> All that talk you have done. 
away with this fellow. Kill him. He is not fit to live. All his pain did not what? Work. God had already spoken to him. So let me tell you, when those people came and were telling Paul, this is how this person's garment to be, he already knew. Are you following what I'm saying here? Even though they were praising by the gift of prophecy, he was confirming something that Paul knew on the inside. It's just that I shan't agree it was plenty of Paul. That's why you see that Paul had a tendency. And I'm saying this, that listen to me, you have a propensity. Anytime he gets even to the Gentile, he will first go to the synagogue to go and be preaching. His love for the Jews made him always go and try to win the Jews first. So it was that very thing there that Satan now used there and brought it up, all right, to Paul. And I'm just trying to say this here now, and I will close with this, that look, this was the same James, even though if you really think about it, well, I was mentioned this afternoon, James too was correct in what he was saying. Because what James' argument with Paul, which I think Paul knew, was that what we teach the Gentiles, you know, Paul came and said, to those who are under the law, I, I operate as under the law. To those who are without the law, as they are without the law. All right? So what James was saying was, we are not telling the Gentiles to do this thing, no. preach justification by faith. But to us, we are not going to leave the tradition that we had in Judaism. We will just mix this salvation with the Judaism we are doing. However, for the Gentiles, all right, so, so that's what they were telling him. But because God did not send Paul, all right, to Jerusalem, and uh, these people had already shown that tendency, all right, to Paul, and I'll quote the scripture and close, the tendency had already been there. Because, uh, because of time ago, Paul had had a meeting when he went with Barnabas. They went up to Jerusalem to go and settle a matter. Remember, it was James that got up and said, this matter, this is my sentence. You can't lay any charge or not. You know, he was James said the thing. Eh? I said you can go. But look at what happened in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. So you just, just know that. So there was still some, ah, the thing was like this in church. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Verse 12. For before that, Peter came to Antioch and was playing with everybody. But before, that certain came from who? James. This James. He did it with the word Gentiles. But when they were come from James, that means James didn't believe this thing they were doing. James, so James, James. And this James here was the Lord's brother. You get what I'm saying? He was the blood brother of, well, not blood brother, but... Same father, same mother. But look, but when they were come, he withdrew himself and separated himself. This is the same James that Paul too went to meet. Are you following him? If your James has shown you, may God grant you strength not to go to James. Are you following what I'm saying? This is just the human weakness of, uh, you understand this? So please, as you're being led by the Spirit, you can go and meet with, you know what you won't do normally? You're now with your classmates. You are now trying to show them that you have not really changed. You have changed. <laughs> are you from saying here? Yeah? Ah, hey, what's up now? Shabib, we used to do it. Uh, ah, ah. You used to say, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, your body again doesn't mean like that. You know, we, we still can do things. You just say, uh, just, just give me three drinks and three. <laughs> are you following what I'm saying here? Yeah? Those are triggers. And um, please, um, you might be laughing now. Paul, this thing did not happen when Paul was a baby. Oh. Paul had established churches. Are you following me here? This thing I'm preaching to you, that I'm preaching to you, eh, is for years to come inside your life. Oh. That you don't get dissuaded because it, listen, if they did not capture Paul, let me just tell you the effect of it. If it's today, that is social media, eh? That is social media. And the word will have spread. They God allowed them to carry Paul before Paul destroyed his ministry. Because if you are preached to the Gentiles not to do it, 
And people take photographs of you, head shaved and everything. Isn't that the end of everything? Happened? They just go and meet the Gentiles and tell them, look at the man that said, you people shouldn't do it. All that fight he was fighting will have done what? Gone. So before he could complete it, God said, carry this man. And let me tell you, Paul was locked up for years until they finally gave him house arrest. You know, he just could move around in his house. People were coming. Disobedience is God's will. And when there's going to be that kind of major disobedience, that's where prophetic comes in. Do you get what I'm saying here? And that they tell you. He says, once I've heard, twice I've Do you get what I'm saying here? Once God spoke, twice I've heard. He tells you. Tells you. All right? And it is a confirmation of something that God already has said. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word and by the power of your spirit, I ask that you strengthen every single person and sound of my voice concerning this and grant them grace for the years to come that they stay strong on that path you've defined for them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you all.